Okay, let's, uh, let's get ourselves assembled and uh, we'll get started with class, please. I, I will uh, crack the whip. So, here we go. So let's, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. And we'll get started in on chapter 6. We're going to look at the book of Acts. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for today. I pray that you would, uh, that you would be able to work what you need to work on for us, both me as the speaker and for, for all of us as learners. May we be able to understand and handle your scripture, that your Holy Spirit might have free reign in our minds, in our hearts, that we would know what the scripture says, that we would be confident in who you are and who we are according to what you say about who we are. That as we look at the book of Acts, that we would be better learners from the book of Acts, that your, your Holy Spirit could teach us that we would understand. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. 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 So we want to we want to ca- kind of do a little backtrack. I drew on the board here. Do, does everyone who was here last week recognize this drawing? That's that's the kind of head shaking I want to see. Awesome. Okay. So the reason that we want to review this, first of all, because there weren't a whole. I mean, we were missing a bunch of people last week, and I want to put this up here because our chapter six is sort of like. Old Testament narrative or narrative part two, okay? So as we look at the book of Acts, it is also almost exclusively narrative. But as I put up here, it is, as far as scripture is concerned, it is a unique book of narrative. Did you read that in the chapter? I can't remember. I... I, I'm juggling several books right now, and a couple of them are parallel, but I was pretty sure, yes. So it's, it's um, you could almost say that the book of Acts is anomalous. It's, it stands alone. That's what that word means. It stands by itself as a narrative book, okay? But, or I should say, and, what we learned last week about the three levels of narrative. Remember that? There are three levels of narrative, and I want to do a little backtracking to make sure we're all on the same page. The highest level, level three, was the meta narrative, which is the story of, so Genesis is over here and Revelation is over here, and that really doesn't even fully do justice because that's the story that God is telling in history about what he has done about acts that he has done. He spoke and light existed. He spoke and trees existed. He spoke and humans existed. He spoke and relationship of man and woman existed. And he created it out of, what was it? Nothing. And then he created man out of dust, and then he created woman out of man which was, who was out of dust. And that old joke applies. Remember that God was in the, in the battle of creation with some scientists. And the scientists said, we can do this creation thing just like you did, God. And so God says, all right, let's do it. And so the scientists reach down and they start grabbing up some dust to create a man out of and God says, uh, 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 create your own dust. Uh-huh. So that's the story of God's meta narrative. He's telling a story. And it's important to remember that you and I are a part of that story. As it breaks down into these individual stories. But the second level is sort of the story of old, in the Old Testament and the New Testament is specifically the redemption of created humans being redeemed. God is redeeming humans to himself through, through Christ. And all, the Old Testament looks forward to Christ, and the New Testament is looking at Christ, and then kind of looking again forward to when Christ returns. And that's, that's the second level. Like there's this redemption story that God is being 
uh, un unveiling in the midst of this meta narrative. And then it breaks down into individual stories. Okay? And that's, you can think of individual stories pretty quickly. If you think, if you grew up in church at all, uh, these individual stories are, are going to be the ones you learned in, in Sunday school and when you were in grade school or whatever. You learned about Noah, Abraham, what, who else? Jonah. Jonah. There's a story, right? So these, uh, Daniel and the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Joshua. Isn't it funny? We never remember. They're like some, like those three guys. That's their that's their Babylonian names, but we don't remember their their Hebrew names. But we remember Daniel. Anyway, but then into the New Testament. Now we have narratives being told about the early church, and so the Book of Acts kind of takes us to the. Uh, to the, the beginning starts with the um, resurrected Christ, and then he ascends. As he's ascending, he's basically saying, hey guys, just wait for the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit shows up, and then boy, doesn't it happen. And there's these stories that are being told, individual stories about the redemption of God who is doing a thing in history. And so... Kind of the, the overarching uh, question that we want to be asking ourselves is this one. And it's, 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 this is, this, these two words are sort of my, the author uses different words, but these are my words to help you sort of understand the perspective of Acts, okay? So Acts is asking the question, are the things that we're reading in the book of Acts in the early church are they descriptive or are they prescriptive? Okay, so we want to ask the question, is, is uh, the, like the stories of Stephen being martyred, are the stories of the early church, you know, in, in the early chapters had everything in common and they were looking out for one another and, and all of those things, uh, caring for the widow's you know, Stephen's sort of appointed to do that as one of the seven, right? <clears throat> so are those stories d just being describing or descriptive of things going on? Or are they somewhat prescriptive where it's saying, I'm using these stories to tell you how it should be for you, right? And that's kind of the, that, that argument of which one is it doing and how does that fit in together sort of the whole chapter that's what it's saying we need to consider uh, when we think of and read the book of acts so uh i think a good way to look at this descriptive versus prescriptive is to pull out one of these individual stories as an example and we're going to go back to good old gideon right he's been our punching boy right here uh, so, let's say that you and I are sitting in this New Testament church. Let's say it's even in Rockford. Let's say it's 2024. And let's say we're trying to discern the will of God. And so we think, wait a minute. I remember a story in the book of Judges. There was this guy Gideon. And he was trying to discern the will of God, wasn't he? Wasn't he? Yes. Right. And so what did he do to discern the will of God? Well, he had this thing known as a fleece. Well, nobody has fleeces anymore, but I have a blanket. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to put a blanket out in the yard outside of Cross Point, and I'm going to say, God, if we should sing hymns in church, make that blanket wet and the grass dry. And if the blanket is wet and the grass is dry, we should only sing hymns. I'm just going right for the jugular, aren't I? Yeah. Worship in the church. And then so we're not sure if God really meant it. So then we say the next night, well, God, I saw that that wasn't wet and then the grass was dry, but can, or it was, I, mean, I, I did it wrong, didn't I? It was, it was wet, but the grass was dry, but I'm not sure. So tonight... I'm going to lay my blanket out there again, but, but this time I want the grass wet and the blanket dry if we should only sing hymns. So 
Is that a good strategy to read Gideon to figure out how to make decisions in the church? If, if you think it is, then you think Gideon's story is prescriptive. It's prescribing the way that you and I should discern the will of God. And so we want to apply those same things. Like as we read these stories in the book of Acts, are we, are we reading things that are descriptive or prescriptive? I think based on last week, we can say that Gideon's story was only descriptive about the fleece, yes? Because actually, fleeces for Gideon were a sign of lack of faith, of being unsure of his footing, of being unclear as to his position and his ability to hear the word of God, the voice of God, to understand the, what God is saying. And, and we, we, we sort of stepped on some toes last week, didn't we? Wasn't it a little painful? Anybody's, anybody's toes a little sore? Yeah. You know, our, our interpretations were getting stepped on. Long-held traditions we have in church that we have to kind of go, uh-oh, I might have misunderstood and misapplied scripture, particularly where Old Testament narrative is concerned. And since this is narrative part two, and it's even scarier for me because it's talking about church, and we're trying to discern how we should be in the church, how much of this should we say, oh, it's just stories that are describing things, but they're not prescribing things? And is there a center, sort of a middle ground? And uh, like we did a couple of weeks ago, where there's like, okay, you've got absolutely things that apply to today, things that don't ever apply to today, and then you've got that center section where we tend to live in the church. We're all, we called it a gray area. Well, I think we're in between again. And it's difficult to, to know, you know very foundationally whether it's descriptive or prescriptive uh, um, fully one way or the other. And so as we come to the book of Acts, we are reading about how the early church was. And we have to remember that there are distinct issues going on. And that, that Luke has a perspective that he's sharing, right? And we read that uh, Luke was a Gentile. He was a Hellenist. Biographer is the way to put it. He was a Hellenist, which means he was Greek-influenced. You know, this Western thought. He was, he was influenced by Greek thought in the way he wrote. But he was also influenced by Old Testament narrative. He was an, apparently an avid reader and knew the scriptures, and so for him it was only Old Testament. He knew the Old Testament very well. And so those stories in the Old Testament were influencing him. And I, I, just, I think he was also aware that God was using him to put down for us, can we say, the things that were happening in the church. And the author does a really great job, I think, of helping us understand what part of this second level, how Luke is interacting with the second level. He's talking in a specific way about redem the redemption story, specifically in the church, right? And we read this last week that Luke's trying to show us a linear path from Jerusalem to to Rome, right? And so it's like this very laser light focused story that he's telling. And it's going from the very Jewish <coughs> Christian Jerusalem church all the way to Rome, which is anything but. You know, and there's this middle stage. So it goes from this very Jewish, very uh, uh, Jerusalem-based church, the intermediate, it's a Jewish Hellenistic Greek-influenced, Jewish with Greek-influenced church, and then it moves to just a Greek or a Gentile church in that linear path. It's just this one path. Why do I call it linear? Because there's a whole lot more going on than we 
hear about. Think about it. I want to give you an example. So that it's, Luke is just giving us this one little snapshot because he's trying to help us see the expansion of the kingdom of God through the church. Moving from Jerusalem and a very Jewish-oriented uh, movement to a very not-Jewish movement. And it's the same God, it's the same Jesus, it's the ha same Holy Spirit, it's the same things going on no matter who the audience in the church is. And, and I think Luke wants us to know that no matter what your heritage, you can be one of, one of, one of Jesus' friends. You can be one of God's children. And that's, that's a big deal, right? So, so that's just this linear thing. So we're only getting this snapshot. It's a very selective narrative. Do you see what I mean by that? So, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Paul writes to a group of Christians in the book of Romans to, to some Christians in Rome. Well, how did Christians get to Rome? If, if, if Luke is telling us in the book of Acts the expansion of the church, do you hear about Rome at all? No. no. So there was, there was Christian influence and, and, and the movement of the Holy Spirit that Luke doesn't account for because that's not what he's worried about. And it's like, you know, so what does that mean? It means we have to be careful and understand that Luke is selecting stories to, to, to help us see something. And that is that the church is an unstoppable force being led by the Holy Spirit. Even today, would we not say that that's absolutely the case? That the, the church is led, being led by the Holy Spirit is an unstoppable force. It, it cannot be stopped, no matter how much persecution happens. When someone comes up to me and says, Tom, the church in America is in such bad shape, I go, no, it's not. It's happening. It's vital. It's being spirit-led. The church in America is amazing. Churches in America are in trouble, but the church in America is doing great. Do you know what I mean by that? One is a little C, one's a big C. The big C church is doing great. In the hearts of the believers who are, who are being drawn by the Holy Spirit along on the path of whatever natural path that you and I walk, we're sharing Christ no matter where we go. That's not being held back. Now, are churches in trouble in America? I think so. I think so. I think that's why Crosspoint's so attractive. This is like free, I'm not charging for this. <laughs> but I think that what's going on here is biblical. It's spirit-led. It's unavoidable. Nobody can take credit for that. Much like Paul says in Ephesians, we're saved by grace. And not our, of ourselves that anyone should boast. Who can take credit for what God is doing here? Nothing. We're being led along. We're on a scavenger hunt. We're discovering at the works that God has laid out for us in advance. That's what Ephesians says. That, that, that that's God at work. And so that's, I think, the, kind of the message of Luke as well. And so we have to be careful when we look at Gideon and say, well, that's not the way to discern God's will. It was just really there to, to show how faithful God was, despite Gideon's unfaithfulness or, or distrust or lack of faith. And that's kind of a pretty awesome story, if you ask me, that it's not reliant on you and me. Gideon, Samson, any of the, you know, these figures that we see down here, and that, that the fleece is sort of secondary, even at the third level of uh, what, what's going on in the text at the time. So... Does that make sense as to what the chapter is trying to do? Yes. Right? So that's, that's, I love this chapter. These two chapters, the Old Testament narratives and the book of Acts is really pretty amazing. I, I love these two chapters. I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you haven't had a chance to read it yet, it's okay. But I want to walk, I want to walk through a couple of things here. Um, the, the thing I love that he does is he, he, he gives you the heading called the first step and it's really a quick little section in the book but he doesn't stay he doesn't get away from his original call on us what's the first step read it 
all in its entirety. Sit down and read it. And then once you finish, go back and read it again. And while you're reading it, jot yourself some notes. Just really quick. Doesn't have to be, this is not a test, but it's like, what do you notice? Who do you notice? What are some words that pop up a lot? What are some words you see a lot in the text? This is a good way to, those are good to write down. And then when you go back and read it the second time, you can, can actually write some references of your notes. Like, oh, I noticed, you know, that there were conversions, and I noticed this phrase, and I noticed, and here's where it, where it showed up, and put the references in there. So the first step, he sticks with it. Read the book in its entirety so you get a feel for what's going on. <laughs> And you see this march of the Holy Spirit driving the church forward from Jerusalem to, once again, Rome. Okay. And this is just one linear story of many stories going on. And, and we, you know, when we read the, the book of uh, Revelation, is it, or is it in John? I, I mix those up because it's the same author, I guess. So there's many more things that were written, but to contain them all would take all the volumes or whatever. That's kind of the same sort of thing, you know? It's like, okay, I'm telling you some things, and here, here's, here's what I'm telling you. And so Luke, once again, his, his approach is to show us the march of the Holy Spirit and its irresistible force that is the church. And anywhere the church is persecuted, what happens? There's an explosion. Anytime the church is persecuted. Think about it. If it was up to you and I, uh, our flesh and blood selves it'd be easy to shut us down but when we're led by the holy spirit forget it god's in charge look out the world is no match amen so uh did you see the six natural divisions in there how how he breaks it down uh did anyone get to watch those videos from the bible project watched one they they break it down kind of into two sections don't they mm -hmm. but then they they obviously split it out but there's kind of two sections right? There's the first 12, and then there's 13 through the end. Is that, is that how they do it? I forget. It, I, I looked at, at it quite a long time ago, but they break it down into two sections. Our author, he breaks it down into six, which is basically the three in the, in, in, um, in the first half and three in the second half. So he, he kind of does it in, in two sections that break down into three each, okay? And it's very fascinating how uh, Luke is, is unpacking this when you start looking at that framework. Did you look at any of those sections that are, are listed there and how it does a natural break? And with Stephen, it sort of moves us into a second section. Like when you get the, in verse 7 you know, of chapter 6, there's this real shift going on uh, to Jewish Christians that are uh, Greek-speaking or whatever. Um, and, oh, that's right. Uh, the Greek-speaking Jews. There's a word in there used that's called diaspora Jews. Okay? Uh, just to be clear, a diaspora Jew is one of the ten tribes of the northern kingdom that got pulled out of their homeland in the northern section of Israel when Assyria came and attacked. Okay? And so they were scattered. And that's diaspora means to scatter that they were part of the 10 tribes that were scattered okay and they got moved to other places of the world and the other places of the central middle east and so they didn't necessarily use uh, aramaic or hebrew as their main language it was usually greek or some other language and so that's what the word diaspora means it just sort of means scattered the scattered jews so there were two tribes that basically stayed in, in, in is, Israel until 586 B.C. In 732 B.C., the first ten were scattered. And were, they were kind of so scattered, you just, they kind of just disappeared almost. And the, the, the two tribes that stuck around until 586 B.C., until Babylon took them out, those, those really did stay pretty, pretty much together because it was just... It was the story for them. So, uh, so that's the word I wanted to make sure everybody knew. I don't know if that, if that confused anybody. What's diaspora mean? Maybe you looked it up. But uh, 
So these diaspora Jews started coming back in their old age from all over the countries around, and they wanted to be buried in their homeland. And so they'd come back to Jerusalem, and they would live until their final days, and then they'd leave their wives behind. And so that's why there were all these widows that we read in the book of Acts. And that's why the, the seven were, were appointed, right? We read about the seven. They were appointed to help care for the, for the widows. And so that's kind of what's going on. And immediately after Stephen's, um, his, I don't know, monologue of the history of Israel, <laughs> uh, a massive... Um, persecution happens of the church which scatters the people and that's where we see the church just starts moving like crazy and this persecution by the Jews who didn't want to convert to Christianity they meant it for evil but God meant it for good and that's where we get this first kind of expansion of, of Christianity that we see in the book of Acts and then it moves further after we see Paul and the Antioch church sort of doing these missionary journeys, and you see this massive expansion of the church. And it's in those six areas of the sections of Acts that we see that story being told. Um, so isn't it interesting, I thought, did you notice uh, some of the, how does the author, um, Luke's purpose? It's interesting because there's a lot of things that our author lists that Luke's purpose reveals about what Luke does not say. So there's all these things that you would think there would be more of uh, interest to Luke that we would read more about. Like, why does Peter sort of disappear in the book of Acts? It's, he's, not, he's not really germane to the whole thing. Is, he's not really important to Luke as he writes. You know, it's, well, we, we focus on Paul a lot in the second half of the book. But why don't we get more stories about Paul? I mean, there's some stories in there that are pretty cool, but why aren't there more stories? Why aren't there other stories about other, other apostles that are preaching the gospel all over the place? Because we know that other people are being led to, to spread the gospel because Rome has Christians in it. And it's never had an official visit, as far as we know, from a missionary. So I think it's, um, it's interesting. It seems like Luke doesn't have any interest in how to govern a church. You know, Paul spends a lot of time sort of writing about ways not to govern a church and, and issues that we don't want to have exist in the church. But it doesn't do a lot of work there as far as in-depth. Like, should you have an elder board, and what kind of things should those elders be overseeing, and should there be deacons or deaconesses, and should there be a distinction between a deacon and a deaconess, should there be an elder and an elderess, <laughs> you know, these kind of things. Luke doesn't seem to really write a lot about that, not a lot of specifics on that. It's almost as if it's incidental when we get that. It's something that he tells about on the way to saying what he really wants to say. And that we read in there that there are primary things that are being written in there in the book of Acts, and then there are secondary things that are being written about. And that every story he writes basically has one purpose to it. He's trying to relate something uh, to his audience that he wants us to learn about. And then he incidentally says some things along the way and sometimes we really in the church have 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 put our foot on solid ground on things that are actually incidental in the in the scripture and we just really we really want to make it a primary thing when it's actually a secondary thing uh, and, and I just think that's interesting for us in, in America and the American church particularly the kinds of things that we end up fighting over, you know? And so it's, um, it's interesting, the variety of the stories of the expansion of the church. 
There's no one way for the Holy Spirit to lead people to tell others about Christ. It's hodgepodge. There's all sorts of stories of how the, the gospel is expanding. You know, it, it's, no, it's not everybody that, that leads someone to Christ uses the four spiritual laws. And if you were to die tonight, those of us who are older know that. What, what's, the, what's the end of that one? Do you know where you're going? Is that a bad question to ask? No. But is that the only way to ask that? Or is that the only way to witness? No. 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 How many of you felt bad that you don't share your faith a certain way? That you feel sort of like you're secondary citizens of, of Christ because you're not more bold in your faith, let's say, or that you don't uh, constantly bring Christ up at any given moment. I, I don't know that that's maybe not one of the lessons we take from the book of Acts because there are these so many different stories and so many different ways we see uh, the, the, the kingdom of God expanding that it takes all of us working in whatever way God uses us to, to expand the kingdom. I don't, I don't want to throw my wife under the bus, but I'm going to. She, she will tell you that there is guilt that she carries around because of certain ways that she thinks she should have maybe shared Christ. And, and you know, there's, I, I can tell you that as her husband, her life shares Christ. Words that she shares, shares Christ. I will tell you that things that she doesn't say, shares Christ. And I just really think that if we're going to be about the kingdom expansion that we read about in the book of Acts, we have to know that God is going to use you or me in a unique way. Some of you have been given the gift of evangelism. Boy, it's really frustrating when you meet someone who has the gift of evangelism. <laughs> right? Yeah. When I was in seminary, you had to go through a class. Guess what the title was? Evangelism, right? There was a guy in our class, every week you were supposed to have so many evangelistic interactions, right? This dude had somebody coming to Christ every week, and it was sometimes double digits. And, you know, I made a joke. I was like, I think that guy will witness to his mailbox, and that mailbox is going to come to Christ. Because <laughs> the Lord had given him favor. He had been given a talent in that. If any of you have that, that gift, amazing. I don't like you, but that's amazing. Because <laughs> it's a check on me. I wish sometimes that I had that. But he gave me other gifts. And I have other ways that I'm going to share Christ. The problem happens when we hide it under a bushel. The bushel basket. If we don't ever consider Christ as a message to others who are without Christ. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know how you're supposed to share that. And everyone is fearful. But let's understand that God the Father made salvation out of nothing. It didn't exist before he spoke it into existence. The plan of salvation is his and his alone. And he's asked you to participate in it. He's going to make new family members that you come into contact with because he's the powerful God who's speaking it into people's lives in a way that is amazing. He's the one that gives us even the ability to see him. Gives us the ability to become one of his children. He invigorates us with grace that we might turn to him in faith. But be a part of that, however it is that God has wired you. Maybe God has given you cookie ministry. <laughs> I think I should be a friend of yours if he did. <laughs> I don't know what it is. What talents and skills and abilities and wirings has God given you? That's, that's the story of uh, the overarching secondary level of redemption that God is telling through the book of Acts is that there's all kinds of different guys and gals and people who are sharing Christ and have different abilities. So that is, that's, that's totally for free, but I just don't want you 
to believe the lies of the enemy saying you don't measure up. Because with Christ, you do. You, you, you do measure up. So I love, um, as we get into the ex- exegetical uh, section, I want to I highlight these three questions. Did you remember the three questions that, that we ask of the text? Um, it's, what is the point of this narrative or speech? How does it function in Luke's total narrative? And why has he included it here? That's um, under the exegetical sampling section. Those three questions, you should write those down as any time that you're going to be looking at a text, you can apply those not just to narrative, but you can say that of any text you're reading uh, in the scriptures. Can somebody give me the page number that that's on? I knew you guys would know it. I knew it. You guys are awesome. 120? Three questions. Okay. Uh, What is the point of this narrative or speech? How does it function in Luke's total narrative? And why is it included here? And then he uses those questions and looks at chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, and then chapter 8, verses 1 through 25. (coughs) And really good discussion in there on how to read the the book of Acts and read them in chunks. And uh, why did I give you, why did I delineate those six sections that the author thinks that Acts breaks down into? I think you should read each one of those sections in one sitting. So if you're going to read some spot in the book of Acts, if you're going to read in chapter 12, verse 5, which section should you read? The section of that whole part that has a, a movement of what Luke is doing there. So, so that would be uh, the third section, verse, n- chapter 9, verse 32 through 12, 24. Read that whole section so that you can understand what 12, 5 is saying. You know what I'm saying there? Do you get what I'm saying? So whatever section you're going to be reading in, in the book of Acts, look in your chapter 6 of How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth and see where that breakdown is because it's a good way to kind of get a full feel of what Luke's trying to do in that section. So that's kind of a guideline on how to read. Okay, so uh, he, he does the, um, the whole idea of choosing the seven and then Samaritans becoming part of the way in chapter eight. So, and then the really, really, really difficult part, which is the hermeneutical part, which is how do we apply this? And we've got to ask this question even more. As we're reading this text, is it descriptive or is it prescriptive? Based on your reading of the chapter, which one would you say the author falls down on? Which side? Descriptive. Neither, right. (laughs) Well, he does both. He really does. He kind of says it's mostly descriptive, but we can't ask the specifics of prescription. He's not giving you a prescription on on, on the nitty gritty level. He's saying, what, you remember some of the examples that he cites that are dealt with in the book of Acts? Baptism, communion, right? Those two things. The book of Acts, we see it in there a lot. And we've argued in church, haven't we? Let's, let's just go to baptism. If you grew up Presbyterian or Methodist, if you grew up Methodist like me, you were, you were baptized as an infant, Right? Because that's the thing you do. Except that there's really no biblical support for that way of doing it. But does that mean you're going to go to a very hot place? No. No. So we can say that baptism is important for a Christian, but a specific kind of baptism? We can't. Because if you're a Samaritan and you came to Christ... We, we know, because the text lets us know, there is no water there. You're not getting dunked in Samaria, because there's not enough water there. So there are probably just a cup of water pouring it over your head, because that's all you could gather. So you were, you were not dunked, but you were probably ablutioned. <laughs> you had water poured over your head. Yes? Right. So can't right. But there is a whole ar- arm of, this, of the church in America that can make an argument for infant baptism. I'm saying, is it 
if you're not baptized, are you going to go to heaven? Yeah. Yes. It's not required to go to heaven. So let's give liberty, even though we know that all of the examples we have in Scripture are of people being baptized as, as believers, yeah, adults. Grandma, I, I have the impression that you're saying it doesn't matter how they, you're baptized. That, I, well, I think ultimately for salvation's sake, it does not. Should I say that again? Amen. Ultimately, for salvation's sake, it doesn't matter how you were baptized. Because the thief on the cross never got baptized. And the Lord Your said, today, I will, yeah, my grandma, <laughs> my prayer warrior in my, uh, in my life. No, no, Grandma Douglas. Oh, Grandma Douglas, yeah, yeah. Because she came to Christ, but she worried because she was not able to be baptized. Right, right. And there was a teaching that she was not going to be saved if she wasn't baptized. Yes. That denomination shall go nameless. <laughs> But that is incorrect teaching. Okay? That's what I'm saying. Okay. Is it a salvation issue? No. Okay. Okay. Is it an obedience issue? Yeah. Yes. Is it something that we should do as a, as a believer once we come to faith in Christ? Yeah. Repent and be baptized seems to be the over... And that's what the text says, that that's the overwhelming evidence. So that has a strong argument for believer's baptism, if you will. If you will. But it doesn't have to be a dunking. It, because, you know, we were doing the Samaritan thing because they couldn't. So, but it is a public profession of faith. But if you had a baptism when you were an infant and you were okay with that and that was enough for you and you love Jesus, you're going to heaven. Right? That's what the scriptures say. Mm -hmm. We confess our sins, he's faithful, just. Okay, if I sin in that unknowingly, he's going to forgive me of it anyway. Right? It's not a matter of salvation. It's a matter of obedience. Communion. Can we move to that one? Just really quickly. The, the communion. How often should we do communion? Well, clearly two times a month, because that's what we do here. Every day. If you were in a Presbyterian church, how, how often, how, how many Sundays a month do you do in the Presbyterian church? However many Sundays there are. <laughs> it's every Sunday. Right? Who's right? Yes, exactly, everybody. <laughs> it's not the number of times we do it, it's that we do it. It's clear that we can say in, with specifics that we are, we are supposed to partake in the Lord's Supper as believers. I don't think it should be once a year. I think that it's, it's clear that the Lord's table was something more important than that. And the Lord takes it seriously. We know that from what Paul is saying in his letters because some people were dying as a result of taking the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, in an unworthy manner, right? So it's a big deal. There's something more than symbolism going on. It's a spiritual communing with the, with the Lord. And it's also proclaiming truth. Jesus, is, Jesus is, had died. He rose from the dead and he went to be with the Father. And we're taking this communion until he comes back. Amen. Amen. So, when we talk about the prescription, the, how to, what, what is Acts prescribing, we say, well, from a broader sense, we can say things. Specifically, we have, to, we have to be a little more careful, a lot more careful, when we try to say specific things. And we've unfortunately, myself included, have tried to say more specific things than the book of Acts in the texts really give me room to say. I've, I've sort of, I've transgressed. I've sinned in, in applying the scriptures in too narrow a way, right? So is, is all that making sense? Okay. And I am excited for the book of Acts that it, it is it is telling us a truth, and that is we're still a part of that Holy Spirit pushing the church into places that the enemy doesn't want it to go. And it will not be defeated. It will not be stopped. And it will, will continue until the Lord returns. So, 
Amen. So let's, uh, Jeannie, put some cards out on the tables. So if you want to grab a card, and that'll tell you where you're supposed to go. And we're going to be back at 745 on the dot, right? Oh, I, I didn't have the questions. What? I forgot about them. I, they're usually delivered to me. So get into your groups, and I'm going to go look for them. Okay, now that we're back together. So I want to ask one of the questions that was on the, uh, the sheet this, this week. Why is it good to outline a biblical book? Why is it good to outline a book? So I'm sorry? You know where it's going, you can remember it, yeah? Helps you study it. Get the big picture. Uh, keep, keep an idea of what the key points are, yes. How many times have you outlined a book of the Bible? Everybody's head goes down. <laughs> uh, one, one of the uh, things that in seminary you had to do was... You, you would end up with an outline of every book of the Bible by the time you graduated from cemetery, I mean seminary. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, the, so many of us clamor to get into seminary. That's right. The thing is, is that it, of all the things you're saying, it deepens and great, you gain a greater familiarity with a text when you outline. And I just had to say that in front of an English teacher, that it's good to outline, but that's the truth. And if you are going to be leading anybody in a study of scripture, would you do me a favor and outline the book before you start teaching them? In a way that you spend a bunch of time on that, devoting time in preparation before you teach. Because this, this uh, text that we're, we're working with here, how to read the Bible for all it's worth, do you realize that it takes effort to read the Bible for all it's worth? Yeah, I, you can't be lazy with this book. Have you figured that out too? Like it asks a lot of you. And some of you have felt like the current of information was, was running over you and was going to drown you. Okay, don't give up swimming. Even though the current is taking you downstream, maybe that's the direction you're supposed to be going all along. But don't give up swimming, because I don't want you to be thinking like you're swimming upstream. <clears throat> Swim with the current. Take what you can in. And definitely trust in the guy, that's for sure. That's right. <laughs> Amen. He's got a purpose while I'm here, so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I put a lot of effort into our times here because you guys matter. And when I don't want to put the time in or I think, oh, there's other things I'd rather be doing or could be doing. Um, I start to think around the room. <laughs> I think a, I, I think my way around the room, right? <laughs> it's it's genetic, right? So, other questions that were popping up from our chapter on Acts, the unique nature that is the Book of Acts. You kind of talked about why it's not in with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why is it? Yeah, because it's not a, it doesn't account the life of Christ. It's like, it picks back up. It's, and, and Luke did, I mean, the, the author does a good job of telling you it, it was a two-volume book that he wrote, his Gospel of Luke and then 
acts. And there, there's, there's a flow to the two books, but the reason it's not placed in those four books is because those four books uniquely talk about the life and ministry of, of Christ. And then this is like the sequel. But it has Christ at the beginning, you know, talking to the disciples. And I, I just, I really love the book of Acts. I'm glad it's there because I, I sort of think, I love Mark and I love Acts because Mark, if you read Mark, I always say that if Mark had a subtitle, it would be the gospel of Mark, those idiot disciples. <laughs> because it's almost like Mark has a bit of an agenda to show that the, the, the disciples didn't have it all together. They were just like you and I. They were just like you. They were like me. They were like us. And they made mistakes. And Christ was more powerful than all their mistakes. And even in the book of Acts, when they're here, here they've watched Jesus hang on the cross, died. Now he's back. Thomas has had his moment. He knows that Christ is who he says he is. And they go and say something like, okay, now are you going to defeat Rome and install your kingdom? And I want to be in charge of some of that kingdom. And Jesus, I can't imagine. I, can just, I mean, there's, this, there's the paraphrase that I do. It's like after that question get a, gets asked, Jesus just shakes his head and looks down and goes, just wait for the Holy Spirit. Because that seems to be the moment when Pentecost hits and they're all kind of hanging around and that fire, tongues of fire rest over them. It's like that, that ongoing um, counselor that is the Holy Spirit really turns the tide for the disciples. And that, why the book of Acts is fascinating for me is you see them, the disciples, and, and those who follow Christ acting like you always kind of wish they would in the Gospels. But it takes some time. And, and Christ's you know, work with that ragtag group paid off because of how powerful Christ was and how awesome the Holy Spirit is, not because of any individual who was name is written in the pages of scripture. Excellent. What, what else? What else did you talk about or notice? Yes. It's, it's unique because of the, of the, like the, the parentheses that it covers, you know, like from Jerusalem to Rome and that telling of that first few years, you know, I, I, I forget exactly where, I mean, they're, they're all over the map how many years are contained within the pages of Acts, like how many literal years were, you know, in between Acts 1 and Acts 28 or whatever, so... I, I'm not, I don't remember, sorry. I'll try to ref find out for you if that's important to you, but, but it's telling this unique moment in time. And even within those pages, as you watched it go from a, again, a Jewish Jerusalem movement to a Jewish Gentile speaking, you know, Hellenistic Jews movement to a completely Gentile movement, and this expansion aspect that, you know, a couple of the questions we're asking about expansion, that's one of the main things that happens within the pages of it. You see this ever maturing movement led by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. and, and so that gives me hope that we are never going to arrive. We're always on our way to what the Lord has for us next. And that's when I was a youth pastor, I would always tell students, I would always take about 12 at the most students. I would disciple them because Jesus was God and he could only handle 12. And he lost one of them. He didn't lose one of them. That's not the theology, but you know what I'm saying. Christianity is a series of false summits. You see that next summit, you're climbing, you're, you're growing in your faith, you're walking your walk, and you get to that summit and you realize, oh, there's another one up there. And then you climb to that one, and you're like, oh, wait a minute. There's another one. And the whole time, you and I need to keep our eyes way, way down the road to the trumpet 
blast that's coming. That's what we keep our eyes fixed on. That is how you course correct today, by keeping your eyes focused solely on heaven on earth. Right? I would tell them that. Life is a false summit, and you keep your eyes way down there, way down there. Keep your eyes on heaven on earth. When Jesus' prayer is finally fulfilled, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's where we're looking. And it's the same as when you learn to drive. When you're looking at your hood, you're, you're jerky. You're always overcorrecting. You're, you're, you're right and you're left and you're right and you're left and you're, getting, you're making everybody in your car sick. You start to go straight when you keep your eyes way down the road. You don't overcorrect then. When you're going around a curve, don't look in front of you. Look way, look seven, eight, nine, ten car lengths ahead of you on a curve and watch how much straighter. You don't overcorrect all the time. That's the way our walk with Jesus should be. As we read the book of Acts, it's giving us a clearer vision of what is to come and helping us course correct by the power of the Holy Spirit in the moment and not of ourselves. So we keep our eyes on the prize. When we, when we run the race like that, it, it, everything seems to work out better in the here and now. And I think that part of what this class is hopefully doing for us is giving us a clearer vision of what is to come. So chapter 7 is, is next week. We're, we, have, um, we have one week off. If, if you guys could, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest it again. If you could... Tell me whether or not you're coming using your app. If you go under events on the app and you can say, yes, I'll be there or I won't be there, a bunch of you are already doing that, so thank you. But it just kind of gives me a, a heads up on what, what the weeks might look like. So what's Chapter 7 all about? It's about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you saw the resource that I posted, okay, I gave you the Old Testament one that was my professor, and then the New Testament one was my other professor. Gordon Fee did one that covers the whole thing, and it's only 14 bucks or something like that on Amazon. So I posted that, that as, a, as a how to read the Bible book by book is what it's titled. And it's a, it's a way to do your exegesis in a very inexpensive way. So it's a great, another great resource. I'm just going to keep posting them there. They're for you. Yes? When, what day is it that we have to meet? Oh, I see. Uh, somebody pull their app up and it'll tell you. It's like the week of Holy Week. It'd be the last week of March, I think. Because I set up all the events for the class, and then one of the events is no class. The Wednesday before Good Friday. The Wednesday of Holy Week. Yep. 27? Thank you, sir. All right, let's close in prayer. We'll, we'll uh, be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for their time together. I continue to play, pray for clarity and that we would not get into a spirit of timidity or fear, but that you would teach us with boldness and we would open your word with, with confidence, not because we're smart enough, but because your Holy Spirit is all-powerful. Lead us and guide us and direct us as in the ways that you would have us go. Bring us back together safely with many questions that we can find answers to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.